Attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar um, on the new EU data protection legislation which is coming up. I'm delighted to be joined today by uh, Neil Thacker, who is the European Security Strategy Officer from WebSense, who will um, take the opportunity to explain to you what is coming up in the new legislation and what you can be doing to prepare. Um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me and we have started the broadcast. If you have any problems with audio, please do pop a note into questions and um, I'll just get started. Thank you. So. Today's objective is to provide you with an update on the pending EU data protection laws and what their anticipated impact will be for IT managers across the UK. Um, to that effect, we have a brief agenda. I uh, will give a short introduction. I will keep it short to um, bytes and security partnerships. Um, introduce why the legislation is important um, and introduce our presenter, Neil Thacker from WebSense. I'll then be handing over to Neil, who will talk about the latest information on these laws, what um, CISOs across the UK are saying about these laws, and what you can and should do now to prepare for those pending legislation. A uh, little bit of housekeeping, just to start. Um, lines will be on mute throughout the webinar, uh, but please do ask questions throughout. They are welcomed. Um, we were hoping to have a really interactive question and answer session at the end. So if you could post questions via chat um, and the questions box, I'll make sure those are collated and pose those to Neil at the end. Um, we would ask that questions are um, limited to strategic discussions rather than commercials on any technologies, um, but those discussions are of course welcome and with your account manager after the um, webinar. If you're not aware of who your Bytes account manager is, please do contact me and I will point you in the right directions. In terms of dates for the legislation going live, they aren't yet defined and Neil has some thoughts around this, but we will keep you posted as regards a likely date as soon as that is available. Lastly, a recording will be available and emailed to everyone who attended and who dialed in today um, so you can share that, the information at leisure with your team. So a little bit about Bytes. Um, Bytes uh, Technology Group, of which Bytes Security Partnerships are the security specialist company, are part of the 2 billion Altron Electronics Group. And within the UK, the Bytes Technology Group is comprised of, of three businesses. Bytes Document Solutions, who are a uh, leading Xerox and print management reseller. Bytes Software Services, who are a software licensing and software asset management specialist company, and also the second biggest Microsoft reseller in the UK, and Byte Security Partnerships, who are dedicated to security solutions. And to give you a little bit about Byte Security Partnerships, um, we have been IT security specialists since 1999, uh, we have been part of the Bytes Group for three years. And since that time, we've worked very hard to combine the specialism and agility of a small independent reseller with a strong technical focus and a technical background with the, the additional resources that come from being part of a large global software group. Um, we, as I said, we, we focus solely on security and are very passionate about security education and aiding businesses in defining their security strategy for events hence the webinars like today. Um, our 50% of our employees are, are technical, so that allows us to give customers real confidence in, in the deployment of their, the solutions and also to enable us to enjoy top partner statuses with um, leading technology vendors such as WebSense who are joining us today and Checkpoint, um, which obviously means that we can deliver real um, procurement value um, for Sorry, I've just got a question from the um, audience saying that my screen is paused. Apologies. So um, if someone can just confirm that the slides are moving now for me. Apologies. Um, I've been talking for a long time. Ah, and it's going on to the next slide. Apologies for a slight technical error. Um, so that's that's a bit about bytes, um, and I'm sure you can enjoy the slides post the, the webinar. A um, little bit um, about why we are talking about the EU laws today. So firstly, why they're important. Um, they will impact UK legislation. These are regulations, um, not just directives. So they will overwrite current UK data protection law. So that there is 
the will impact the the UK laws when they are launched. And um, secondly, there are wide financial um, penalties for non-compliance, and these range from two to five percent of global turnover. So it's um, really important that businesses look and understand what these um, regulations are going to be. Um, and thirdly, that. Um, ignorance will no longer be deemed to be blessed as regards breach management and breach notification. So um, it is important that companies are reporting breaches and no longer um, are making a real effort to define and, and discover those breaches and, and publicize those to the public. Um, so why are we talking to you about these now? Um, Firstly, the ratification timescales are unclear. They could be launched um, fairly soon, depending on how long they take to go through the, um, the EU sign-off process. Uh, we want you to be able to prepare for these laws in advance, um, as a lot of the regulations will require a, a rethink of certain parts of security strategy. And lastly, technologies are available now to, to help you do that and to help you better protect your organization's data. So to that effect, um, all that it remains for me to do is to introduce our guest speaker, um, who's Neil Thacker. He is the EMEA Security Strategy Officer from WebSense and enjoys 15 years' experience across information security, um, 10 within end-user organizations um, within financial services. Um, so he, he's able to take a strategic view from, from as he's sat in your, in your seat within organizations before. He also is highly involved in contributing to the EU agency program alongside um, CERTs to position the threat landscape so he can look at the impact of these regulations strategically. Um, and he's involved in discussing these with CISOs across the UK and Europe. So a really great person to give us an update on these regulations. So all that remains for me to do is, is to hand over to Neil. Um, the screen will go to the holding screen very shortly, and then you'll be able to hear and see Neil. Thank you very much. So yeah, thanks Shona, um, thanks for the handover, thanks for the introduction. So um, welcome everybody, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to, to join today's webinar. So yeah, my name is Neil Thacker, I'm Information Security and Strategy Officer for WebSense for Amir. Um, my background again, as Shona mentioned, I've been involved in security now for 15 years. She said she, said that she mentioned that I've enjoyed over the last 15 years the challenge of security and uh, again, it's something that I've seen changes in the last few years and um, this is why we're actually talking about the legislation today because changes are, are, are what we are looking to um, adopt some changes, some ma massive reforms across the EU um, that will affect most organizations that process any type of PII. So the talk today is covering that EU data protection and PII specific, that personal identifiable information. So as, as Shona mentioned, my background is I look at threat landscape, I work with um, CISOs on a daily basis. I met over 500 CISOs already to date this year, talking about what the next steps and what places that you can actually start preparing um, for this impending legislation. So I'll walk you through that um, today. So a quick disclaimer, um, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> this is a really important um, statement to make. Um, so I'm, this is based on my experience, based on what I've read, based on what I'm learning from, again, CISOs out there that are already looking at the legislation, are working with their legal uh, working groups, are working with their data protection officers to be prepared for this. And what I'll be covering today is how typically you can apply technology elements of uh, adopting and changing processes and even educating people on the best way to handle uh, PII going forward as well. So yes, as I mentioned, I'm definitely not a lawyer, but the idea really is that I'll be covering some, some key um, aspects, ways in some, in some cases to demonstrate that and again looking at quick wins, how you can even start talking potentially to the board about the potential impact of the new legislation. So. Um, I always like to test um, that people are uh, awake and also they're, they're going to be having the option to ask questions and chat. So a quick, uh, a quick uh, introduction. Um, it'd be great. It'd be a great quiz to start off today. Is name the year. So I'll be showing some images. If anybody has an idea what year it is, feel free to fire that into the questions or chat. 
and uh, yeah, they, they, we'll choose we'll choose the first person to respond with the correct year to win a prize. So um, name the year. This was a this was the year that Netscape Navigator was launched. Um, really important year. Took browsers to another level. Very exciting times if you were in involved in IT at that time. So Nets, Netscape Navigator was launched. We also had the first the first version, the full version, the full final release of Java 1.0. Um, and again, this was an important time in, in some cases for information security. It's been a burden ever since um, because of vulnerabilities, because of typically the impact our organizations. And again, looking at threat landscape, Java is still again a, a target for, for most uh, hackers trying to access, compromise, look at vulnerabilities. Java is still the number one. We also had, this is kind of a given, uh, we also had the launch of a, uh, a new operating system. Uh, called Windows 95. So I think you're now you're now pretty you're now pretty sure what, what year it was. But at the same time, we also had the new EU directive that was launched. It was in 1995. It was many many years ago, coming up to 20 years old. Uh, that talked around again best ways to protect data, and it was a directive. So the idea really of the 28 member states um, currently they all have adopted the directive and pushed out their own legislation. So in the UK, we have the 1998 Data Protection Act that takes guidance from this EU directive. So because of this, because it's nearly 20 years old, there's obviously been a request for change. In 1995, only 1% of, uh, of the population had access to the internet. Nowadays, we see that completely changing, that some people now have multiple devices that are connected to the internet on a regular basis. And in some cases, they're sharing Again, their own personal information, their name, their address, their email address. Uh, again, in some cases, their date of birth, etc., with companies that are collecting this data and are using this data as well. It's an important. To, it's important to understand how that how that how that change is, is coming to force, and why it's now important that the reform, the data protection reform, is being discussed. So. What are the current direct directive highlights? What is it that's now applicable to you as part of the current directive, as part of the current legislation typically that's been pushed through as part of the UK Data Protection Act? So again, as I mentioned, the directive 9546EC uh, was approved by the EU Parliament and the councils at the moment. And it, the idea really was to protect individuals with regarding the processing of personal data and the free movement of such data. So we actually started setting out some key um, key indicators of will and how we can actually do this. So initially it was a set of notice, so identify those subjects and tell them that their data is being collected and given them notice. This is the current directive. Purpose again, a specific purpose to say why that data was being collected and that it will be used for no other intended purpose. This is an interesting discussion point that is uh, setting some interesting discussions around the working groups and the work councils around the actual purpose of data collection. And this is something that, again, the, the directive that currently exists has put into place to ensure that there is a specific purpose and the data isn't used outside of that. Then, obviously, we have consent. Again, personal data should not be disclosed or shared with, without, with third parties without consent from those subjects. Security, so once it's collected, the personal data should be kept safe and secure. So, uh, for, Neil, yes. sorry to interrupt. Um, a couple of people have said there might be a scaling issue with your slides, that okay. the, the, the view is truncated to the right and bottom of the slide. So if there's something you can do to, to pop that in full screen, um, sorry to interrupt, um, I just okay. want to make sure everyone can see the full screen. Okay, let's just check that. How is that? That's 100%. That's, uh, I think I think the issue is that there's no change. I think the issue is that the the screen size potential your screen size is is smaller than than some people's. Can can we bring that up on a different view? Yeah, let's take a look. Just want to make sure that everything's clear for everyone on the line. Apologies, guys. Live demos and live webinars can be <laughs> challenging. Just pause pause slightly. Potentially, if you try sharing the specific app rather than the screen, let's have a look. We're just going to take that, that, that down, see if that's going to work now. Is 
bear with us, guys. Thank you very much for flagging it. Okay, so that's showing the application only. Has that rectified the problem for most people? No, the view hasn't changed, Neil. Okay, no worries. Let's try a few things. Thank you very much for your patience. We will, we will make sure that this is sorted within a minute or so. Do bear with us, everyone on the line. This list, that's what some people are saying, that's a bit worse, how are we going? No, worse now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's check, this is 100%. Let's take it, take it down on, in, in size. Yeah, I think sure someone said that your slides are in 16.9 but are being presented in 4.3. Okay. To lower the screen resolution, which, some, which yeah. you've worked out yourself. Let's just okay, bring we've that got down technical to... people on the line. I wouldn't have a clue what to do with this at all. Thanks everyone for your patience. We will be back up and running properly in just a few moments. Let's try this now. No, I think it's the same. So let's uh sorry about this people. I just don't want to miss any of the content on the slides. Try and, I think some people are saying potentially lower this further, lower the lower the screen resolution. Okay. Take that right down to laptop size. Thanks for your suggestions, Guy. So uh, this, this is typical. Uh... Typical live demo stuff. Apologies. <laughs> Thanks everyone for chipping in on how to sort. You're a very active audience, that's for sure. Thank you. Let's just show the application and it looks better. Let's see. This, this is starting to look a bit better. There we go, we've nailed it. Thank you. You are a cool. wonderful okay. audience. <laughs> we'll get cracking again. Apologies for that. Okay, great. So, yes, yeah, so um, obviously when we talked about the security, so once the, the data has been collected, uh, personal data should be kept safe and secure. And obviously this is an important uh, task, uh, item to mention because obviously the value of data, um, something that was predicted actually in, in 2012 was that the current value of EU citizen Neil, data... Sorry, you've still, got, you've still got your toolbar up. You need to take the, the toolbar up. If you just hide all of that, please, and your, your toolbar is covering some of the screens, you just need to hit the, the orange button on the toolbar to hide it. There we go. Cool. That fixed okay. it for everyone. <laughs> Good stuff. Here we are. I, so yeah, obviously, <laughs> so the the value of uh, EU citizen data has, again, at a time in 2012, was um, estimated to be worth 315 million euros to um, to EU businesses. But in fu the future, um, in 2020, it's predicted that the value of EU citizen data will be one trillion euros. So again, this is why, in some cases, the security around protecting and, and keeping that data confidential is really important. And obviously, we have had trust issues in the past uh, few years 
around uh, uh, obviously surveillance, government surveillance, all these kind of things. So actually, security now is again is moving, uh, m forging ahead as one of the important areas to focus on. We talked around uh, again disclosure. This is something that currently exists in the current directive around again the, the disclosure. So when data is being collected, that the the, um, the subject is informed on a regular basis and also it's disclosed when that data is shared with other third parties. Um, again, nothing's really changed too much regard, regarding the access and the subject should be granted access to their personal data and be allowed to correct any, any inaccuracies. But the idea really is movement of data with the proposed legislation will improve and will also increase and will also have the ability for the right to be raised. We already have a, um, a some legislation in place regarding the right to be forgotten, which again m many of you may have already be heard about with Google being uh, this being apl applicable to Google and Google's response to part of this. So the access and the request to be raised is something that is, is important at the moment and something that needs to be uh, uh, understood by most organisations. Accountability, perhaps one of the, uh, the top items in information security at the moment, is making sure that the data collectors are accountable for this. And again, how that how is that going to change as part of the the new legislation? And of course, anything outside any type of EU citizen data transfer outside outside of the uh, European Union, um, two countries and governments that don't have the same type of legislation, what is that actually going to mean to the um, to the individual, to the EU citizens themselves? In most cases, it hasn't been um, allowed to do that. And there's discussions around safe harbour. And again, the working group 29 is looking at this and, and ways to apply these types of things. So this is the current legislation. This is how it actually affects organisations to date. One of the one of the biggest issues is uh, not being aware of this directive, or even some in some cases not adhering to this directive. The impact has been not as significant as it's proposed currently. So fines initially, so fines a few years back were up to five thousand, uh, up to five thousand pounds for a, uh, again, showing negligence or gross negligence as part of this. This has recently changed and up to um, 500,000 pounds as part of that. But again, it still wasn't a significant amount. It still wasn't a significant impact to organizations uh, to take this seriously. And this is something that I've been involved in roundtables even over the last five years, and that has changed because, again, the 500,000 is something that can be accepted as part of any type of risk management program if you're a large enough organization, which again hasn't really put in the interests of the, of our, of the EU citizens uh, into place. And this is something that I think that the legislation is the primary focus is that's looking to change. So what are the, um, the, again, the, top, the top items that are going to be introduced as part of the new EU data protection legislation? So first, if you process more than 5,000 data subjects, um, then you will need to um, assign the role of a data protection officer to somebody in your organization. And that will typically sit within the legal team. So even with the UK Data Protection Act, some companies, some organizations will already have that data protection officer. For this, this, this relates back to processing of 5,000 data subjects within each country. So you may need to be, you need to assign additional roles to data protection officers across the EU. So it's not just a, a one-off exercise for one data protection officer. It will need to be uh, a new role, a new assigned role to those where you're processing those within each country. There will be this right to be a raised requirement. So again, a EU citizen will have the, the option to request all of their data is erased from your systems, from your databases, any, anywhere that, that data is stored. And you will need to actually show that you can actually um, perform that type of action. It's something that is, it is most organizations today will probably struggle with because of how they manage unstructured data. And that's an important, um, or again, requirement to understand. How are you going to um, achieve that type of request and also prove that you've erased their data securely? As I mentioned before, the changes to the legislation are moving away just from looking at data controllers, but also including data processes so that both are accountable. The idea really is, again, is to shift some of the accountability, some of the responsibility onto those companies that you work with as third parties that process data and process EU citizen data. Again, the legislation will apply to both. So you could either be a controller, a processor, or in some, some cases you could be both. 
you could be processing data for other organizations. One of the, um, one of the top line items is the mandatory disclosure of data incidents or data breaches within 24 to 72 hours. Now, as part of the legislation, this keeps changing. There's, uh, that when we go through and we look at the updates, it can vary between 24 and 72 hours. The current proposal is um, within 72 hours. And again, the idea really is this, this is something that for most organizations, they may struggle with. We actually did a, a survey, and I'll, I'll cover the, um, um, some of the results um, later on as part of this presentation from with uh, Ponemon, looking to identify um, companies that have, that have had data stolen or they have had an incident of an insider and they didn't have any insight or any type of data forensics to identify what data was stolen, which is actually a pretty significant issue, um, especially if, you're, if you're, you are now, it's mandatory to disclose those types of data incidents relating to PII. You have to know what data was stolen. And again, probably the headline um, item here is the fines will be changing. So instead of the £500,000 um, fine that can be issued currently by the ICO, um, the, the new legislation, the proposal includes fines up to 5% of worldwide revenue, which is for most organizations a significant amount. And now uh, is already been discussed in the boardroom of, again, how do we ensure that we do not get fined 5% of our worldwide revenue? because that, in most cases, will cut any profit we make that year. And actually, in some cases, it could end organizations. So again, this is something to be, uh, to be aware of. This fine has changed. The, the percentage has changed from 2% um, from to 5%. And it's something that, again, I think has been, has been put in place to ensure that this is understood. The legislation, the incoming legislation is understood, and the impact is also understood, and the priority around protecting that data is, is now critical. It's not something that we can do as a nice to have, it is now a, crit a critical requirement. I recommend if anybody wants to look out uh, and, uh, and go onto Twitter, for instance, hashtag EUDataP, you can find lots more information around discussions, what's going on. Again, the working parties that are involved as part of this are looking at the impact of organizations as part of this work. But these are the top five standout um, changes to the legislation that all organizations should be aware of today. This is how I, I map this back out to typically how you, how you would then take on the next stage, how you would potentially define your strategy based on this incoming legislation. And this is a, a basic security um, blueprint of how you can apply good security practices in your organization. And in most cases, it's identifying vulnerabilities, it's identifying risks, and it's identifying those most, most critical assets. And here, obviously, I've added PII as a, as a data asset that your organization may collect, that may process. And again, as I said, it will add value to your organization to process that data. Again, to work with the consumers, the customers, the, those people that supply you with that information, it is an asset you actually have. And in most cases, this is where we need to start looking at the value of those assets and the potential impact relating to a basic risk management framework. The owners in most organizations for this case will be your data protection officer. You may have assigned information owners who will be accountable for that PII. The idea really is that from an information security perspective, you should already be meeting with them and discussing what the proposed legislation is going to mean and the impact to your, to your organization. And again, as I mentioned before, if there's, a, if there's a lack of budget around data security and the ability to identify and protect that PII, this is now a very, again, a very tactical implementation. It's something we need to start looking at very quickly we don't already have data security controls that exist. The, the catalyst for all of these things, again, we talked before about privacy as being probably, probably one of the most top line items that's being discussed at the moment. And there has been some loss of, again, some trust. Um, there's been concerns around privacy, about what data is being stored and shared with organizations. And again, this actually came out, there was a, there was a panel recently um, for discussing surveillance in New Zealand and um, citizen data within, within New Zealand. And again, this panel uh, was made up of uh, Julian Assange, as we know from WikiLeaks, Edward Snowden, who obviously, as we, everybody will know, the recent um, Snowden revelations uh, last year and the impact based on that, and also um, Kim.com. And again, highlighting that surveillance and privacy are really important um, as of today. 
For me, it's more important to look at, perhaps in some cases, what Martin Rickarts, the new EU Justice Commissioner, highlighted again earlier on this year, in that the value of data has grown and will continue to grow. And again, will enable businesses. It will unlock um, businesses. It will look at the value of data. And the new legislation will help with organizations looking at how they apply and how they adhere to that legislation and focus on that true single digital market rather than looking at multiple legislations across the EU. It's important that we understand that. And the idea really, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be a blocker. It's not really about the fines. It's ensuring that that data has a value, has importance in organizations. And again, a closing statement here, it is a market opener uh, for organizations across the EU. So this is the recent survey that we highlighted. We're looking at data security in general. We're looking at perhaps weaknesses where organizations don't have the right types of technology. And something we highlighted when we did this, we, uh, we sponsored a Ponemon Institute survey where we surveyed up to almost 5,000 security practitioners in 15 countries, many of them across the EU, and highlighted some kind of major findings, perhaps in some weaknesses in their security programs and in their technologies as well. So the majority of them said, 57% said that they didn't think their organization was protected, and 63% said that they doubted they could stop the exfiltration of confidential information from their organizations. And obviously confidential information here can relate, of course, to the PII that those companies process. 80% said their company's leaders do not equate losing confidential data with a potential loss of revenue. Um, as I mentioned before, again, that confidential data, PII, we're already saying that a £500,000 fine exists. The average cost of a data breach is between two and three million pounds uh, in most organizations. And the idea really is that we're looking at how, how we can actually help communicate that back to the company's leaders so they actually understand that losing data will impact them going forward. And again, the fines will, will only, help, only help with that. And again, perhaps one of the biggest statements here is that 35% said that who, who had lost sensitive or confidential information that were a victim of a data breach did not know exactly what data had been stolen. So again, as part of the new legislation, how do you actually identify and, and notify the relevant, um, the relevant in, in some cases in the UK, the ICO, that you've had a data breach when you actually don't know what data was being stolen? And that's one, again, for me, the standout item here is that Companies at the moment that are suffering uh, data breaches that are being attacked as part of either a targeted attack, again, or in some cases an insider, uh, insider um, stealing data, they don't have some of the data forensics tools to help them identify exactly what, what has been stolen from their organization. So how do you typically do this? This is a, this is a process. This uh, relates back to some of the, the NIST critical infrastructure framework that was defined earlier on this year of ways to actually go about doing this. And one of the standout points is looking at how you identify your data. And do you have any PII data that is stored? If you are somebody that processes and transacts with this data, um, you should have a, a clear view of where this data is and be able to identify this. A data at rest, data in use, data in motion. Those, again, some, some core controls that organizations should be looking at today. And as a means to justify some additional spend in data security, looking at T uh, tools that can help you discover data, look at the unstructured data above and beyond the, 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 st the structured data. This is something that organizations need, need to focus on. And I'm, I'm seeing currently moves to do this. With the, um, the next step is looking, once you've identified your data, then looking at how you can then protect that data. Again, do you use things like encryption? Do you use anonymization? Do you use masking techniques to protect that data? Or then do you look at some of the fundamental uh, Again, so some of the fundamental wins that we see in uh, information security, basic access control. Looking at the audience, look at the frequency, how often that data is, uh, is accessed. And again, looking at even at behaviors around handling that data. These are two, ele two elements that can definitely help with your security strategy going forward. Um, some of it is process driven, uh, majority is still technology driven to help you do that. Then, of course, if you do suffer a data incident, even after you've, you've applied your strategic approach to identifying and protecting your data, how do you then detect you have an incident and meet the, the requirements of, again, the data breach notification laws? How do you respond to those incidents again? Do you have a process defined that helps you identify or even, even, even build an incident response team 
that can help you communicate and get your data protection involved as part of that so that they can actually start issuing notices to the ICO that you had a data breach. And again, finally, how you recover from that. Most organizations will struggle based on the new legislation that's coming in um, to recover from certain incidents if they don't follow the first four steps. The ability to identify, protect, detect, respond. But they should have also a process here on how they can recover from this type of incident. Typically what I see is this, is the, this should be the mindset of most information security professionals today. They should be looking at each five stages of these, of these things and actually looking at where they have controls, where they have some gaps, where they have some weaknesses. And again, as I said, identify and protect should be a strategic, um, a strategic method going forward on how you get better at data protection. And your tactics should be reviewed on a regular basis. Something I tell the security operations team in my organization is that they need to start looking. Even if they look at detecting incidents, they need to look back at the controls on how they're potentially being able to identify the target of these attacks, which is the data. So how have they been able to identify and protect the assets these, these guys are after? So some of the information protection challenges we still face, um, primarily around compliance and risk as well. There's many information protection challenges outside of just the EU, uh, EU Data Protection Acts and the legislation that's coming in. One of them is, again, is around how we can actually minimize accidental data leakage because, of course, sometimes it's not something, it's not an external threat that comes into your organization. It's somebody already in your organization that has access to this data that accidentally, accidentally leaks that data. And again, of course, you would still need to disclose that to the, the commissioner's office if you suffer that type of incident. It seems to be the most common type of, again, data loss and data leakage is the accidental data leakage. Many of it can be um, discussed and actually training and education of employees around who, who's actually handling that data and actually monitoring for changes to that. These are, these are kind of the, the, the challenges, but also the ways to, again, apply good security practice around these things. Uh, demonstrating compliance on a regular basis, showing that you're actually in compliance with the legislation is always a great way to do that. And again, in some cases, you need to have technology to help you do that. Um, malicious data theft, again, either from an insider or an external party, and looking at how you actually do that and how you actually achieve that. And again, even with the, bring, the adoption of cloud applications and infrastructure, where the data no longer resides on your endpoint or on your, in your data center, your data is now outside your organization, how do you actually enable the business and bring in cloud applications and infrastructure when also you're trying to mitigate and reduce the likelihood of data leakage from insiders and even external parties targeting that. So these are the four main challenges I see in organizations today. How to minimize accidental data leakage? Well, primarily we see data leakage occur across the email and web channels. Um, it's primary, primary web that we see. So with access opening up um, across, again, to other types of uh, file storage systems for even from the attacker's perspective, they may be looking to exfiltrate data through the web channel. It's still the number one channel that we observe uh, of data being uh, targeted and then being stolen from your organization is the primary channel. So again, monitoring those two channels become really, really important. People sending an email and sending it to the wrong person by mistake, again, the accidental data leakage, that's an important area to start focusing on as well, looking at where that actually happens and having the ability to identify those things and also then block that from happening when it relates to PII are all going to be requirements as part of this. Definitely educating employees on inf information protection policies that already exist in organizations, but again, even looking at identifying broken or b uh, bad business processes. So this is again something that organizations I still see struggle, str they struggle with. It's not a something that they, they believe exists in their organization. But again, I see this on a regular basis that there is a broken uh, business process that exists with data being shared without people in that organization, such as the data protection officer and the information security officers not being aware of that process exists. So monitoring those channels, being aware of where data is being sent, that data in motion becomes really, really important. So how do you demonstrate compliance? Well, again, interpret the regulations. So again, with the current legislation, understand them, understand what, how it affects typically the, 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 the country and the county you're in, and also start looking at your incident management and also remediation plan as well, and how you can demonstrate that. One of the tools I see most organizations missing is some type of data forensics or DLP technology. 
and again, and that can help you with your incident management and remediation also. Again, as part of the EU legislation, there is no specific mention of technology, but again, you have to understand where your data resides, you have to understand who is accessing that data, and you have to understand where that data is being sent to and how it's being interacted with. Again, even if you're looking at data sovereignty, and again, the, 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 in some cases, the destination of that data, these are all things that, again, are typically a DLP technology give you, but they also give you the, the ability to identify those incidents and also help you with that remediation. Again, data breach notifications will help you here as part of a DLP uh, deployment. Again, looking at audit, working with in, internal audit teams, looking at how you typically you run your data governance and demonstrate compliance here. These are, again, all important areas that, from a security perspective, the legislation will help us with and further enforce the need to do this. It's no longer just, again, as I mentioned before, a nice thing to do, a nice thing to have. It's, a, it's now a requirement. We have, to, we have to get better at this. And of course, again, if we have malicious insiders or if we have external parties looking to target this data, this is an area we need to start focusing on as well. Again, with discussions, we're already talking about the value of data and PII, so a name, address, and a date of birth is now worth more money on, on, the, on the ground markets than a single um, piece of card information. So again, this is something to be aware of. So typically, the, your threats, your, your, your adversaries, your threat actors are targeting that data, and they're looking to steal that data and actually looking to monetize that data as well. So monitoring those potential leakage channels becomes critically important. As I said, if it's through web, that's one of the primary channels out. Again, email is still used. So there, there, there is a requirement there to look at your countermeasures in that place and again work with your internal audit and data protection officer to justify why you potentially need to improve your, your countermeasures in those spaces. Um, again, integrated threat prevention from malware attacks. The idea really again is to look at again the likelihood of you being targeted for data. If you have data, uh, it's already probably aware that the, the threat actor will already be aware of that. They know you process this data. They're going to they're target you for that data, and you need to be aware of this. And how you look at somebody looking com coming into your organization, and then looking at potentially um, the, the indicators, looking at some cases, some of the techniques and, and tactics they're using to extricate that data, a lot of it relates to malware being used. So again, even identifying that malware at an early stage becomes quite important. Um, based on the action the, the attacker will take. And then finally, again, identifying and blocking that, that concealed data exfiltration. So great ways to bypass the DLP technology is to encrypt the data. And in most cases, organizations will say, you know what, we no longer have a control if data is encrypted. But again, there are ways to identify things like custom encryption, ways to identify the source and destination of that data, and again, look for anom anomalies as part of that. DLP is a a great technology that can help you there and again look for changes in behavior look for in some cases sentiment analysis where you can actually look at changes to, to how people actually behave in their in the organization and again should they really be processing and handling that type of data as part of this so business name one this is again a, a top item uh, that information security really has been involved in the, in the last few years is looking at how you can actually enable the business and get them to use this data as a, as a valuable asset some of it has been focused on classifying and protecting that data. So again, if you have databases, if you have storage areas and looking to classify that data to protect that data, primarily at rest, becomes again an, a really important requirement to have as part of this. But also monitoring and controlling those sensitive data flows where you have uh, existing relationships with third parties, processes, etc., looking to identify them. Something I always uh, always interested in, in discussing is looking at ingress and egress points from networks, and start understanding again where is that data flowing and what type of data is being is being processed as part of that, what data is being communicated, how is it being communicated, is it being encrypted, is the tunnel being encrypted, are there ways to break into that and again intercept that type of data, and these are things that again from a from a legislation perspective, they don't make clear and precise statements around what you need to do here. But again, if you are the victim of a, um, a targeted attack with data theft as the action, you need to be have, to have the ability to do that, to prove that, again, you have monitored your ingress and egress channels. You have monitored, in some cases, your endpoint also to identify suspicious activity. 
it's no longer good enough to say we were a victim of, a, of an attack, we didn't know what data was stolen, we have to prove that there was data involved, and if it is PII, then we have to notify within that short period of time. That's going to be one of the biggest challenges I see for organisations going forward. Other advice, again, I mentioned suspicious activity. This is a this is a great corporate image of a suspicious activity. This is something that is again is not really something you need to identify as suspicious. This this is very strange. But in most cases, most of your traffic flows, going back to the previous slide, the, the controls and data flows that you have, they're not going to be as standout as this. This is something that again isn't a um, isn't an easy indicator to identify without technology. So technology, you have the baseline, you have to look at the elements of what data is allowed, who has access to that data, the frequency of that access, and again, how is that data being transmitted. If, if anything that's outside of that, any type of outlier as, as part of that, this is where you need to start, um, the alarm bells need to start ringing, and again, start looking at the investigation perspective. Looking to run some type, some type of triage, and again, these things will be hidden. These things are pretty hard to find. And again, they're not, they're not going to be stand out. So it requires some resource, but it requires lots of technology as well to help you as part of this. Ways to do this, a way that technology can help you with this. Um, again, DLP is the primary technology we're seeing at the moment. So holding meetings to discuss what type of technology can help you with the legislation, DLP is there. And actually, um, many, um, again, Analyst companies are actually predicting that data security is 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 going to be the fastest growing technology over the next few years, and it's going to overtake email security and potentially overtake web security as well. When we start looking at again ways that DLP technology can be used to help with again the impending legislation, looking at things like keywords and reg regex and dictionaries can help you with all types of data. Natural language processing can help you with that sentiment analysis. Fingerprints can can help you as well. One of the core uh, values I see from DLP technologies now, which include the WebSense DLP technology, is elements of machine learning to understand patterns, to understand types of data and how they're being processed. Again, this is, these are really valuable technologies that can help you with, one, reducing false positives, um, and again, looking to identify and protect that data. Even if it's anonymized, even if it's only certain specific types of that data is being accessed, these are all the really important um, aspects to take in mind. And also, again, as part of that pyramid, the, the ultimate uh, idea really is to add, apply these types of technologies and look at primarily that data theft. Looking at real-time information as well, as this occurs, will help you with your data breach notification. So looking at the user services that are, that are applied, typically most technologies will help you with this, they'll give you some information but it has to be real-time, it has to be timely, it has to be accurate, it has to be actionable. These are kind of three core areas where we focus on. And it also has to be, in some cases, we have to offer some data awareness. If somebody's, by mistake, sending data to a destination that hasn't been agreed, then we need to stop that from happening and we need to, we need to um, educate that employee. These are all good ways to, again, demonstrate that you're, you're not being negligent around protecting that data. You're offering some education around this, and this is something that, again, is available in technologies today. Um, and again, again, looking at the destination awareness, where is this actually data going? Is there any sort of redirects that happen ac across that place? Is there anything that's happening that is that is suspicious at this point in time? And that's how we typically use things, again, like the, the web intelligence factor as part of this as well. It's, it's important to understand the destination of a lot of where this data is going. Monitoring alerting, again, these are just some samples of where we're seeing the need for greater data forensics. And again, if you don't have a data forensics technology at the moment, this is a good good time to start speaking to, again, if, you, if you're the information security manager, speaking to your CIO, speaking to whoever holds the budget for information security to say we need greater data forensics technologies. Because again, we need more context. To return and, and actually highlight data protection and data breach notification, we have to do that. And we have to add the context. And having the, the alert B, again, is going to help you with your triage and help you with your, um, your response as part of this, going back to the identify and protect. This is going to help you as part of that as well. Having more context-driven security and data-driven security is, uh, again, a good thing to have as part of the, uh, the legislation coming in. So you can actually identify an incident rather than a series of events. So it's not just again on the web and email channels, focusing on looking at your, your endpoint as well and potentially where you have data leakage. And again, people, disgruntled employees, knowing the value of that PII, 
looking to uh, to take that data. They may have access to it. They may look to escalate privileges to gain access to that data. Um, and typically, how they're typically going to remove data from your corporate machine, or again, even if you have a another type of device that's on a network, how are they actually going to look to leak that data out? Be it for USB, through a local printer, printing that data. Again, legislation is going to be cover covering that all types of, um, again, data in use, data in motion, and how that data is, again, secured appropriately. So, again, losing printed documents with lots of PII, again, is also a, again, you are, you are in some cases, you're going to be shown to, to show negligence around that, so it's important to understand that. And, again, how you can look at the channels, how, we can, you know, how you can start prioritizing on areas you need to focus on, where you have some gaps that currently exist in your process or technology space. Um, inside a threat, these are some tools that, again, you can go out there, you can buy for a, a small amount of money, sort of 25, 30 pounds, um, that can actually even test some of your technologies and test some of your endpoint technologies looking at data theft. So it's the USB rubber ducky exfiltrator, one of my favorite uh, tools that I can use to demonstrate some of the weaknesses of endpoint data security, um, look into steal data, look into actually uh, run with, again, run some exploits on that machine, looking to target specific sets of data, and then looking to lift that data and off your, off your network and steal that data. Looking at how you can actually identify these types of devices, some basic endpoint technologies cannot detect these at all. Um, it requires, again, a more advanced technology, a more advanced type of DLP endpoint technology that can help you do that as well. Because, again, the, these tools are available. They're easy to purchase. You need to be able to identify these things and actually stop them from actually, again, incidents occurring in your organization as well. So just a quick summary, because I know we're, we're running out of time. And again, I apologize for these slight technical issues at the beginning. Um, how to be prepared for this. So one of the, again, key points I start focusing on is looking at your people, process, and technology, and really look at it today. Um, if you can tomorrow, but it has to be done this week. It has to be something that, again, the legislation is coming in. The next round of discussions will be December. Most are expecting the legislation to hit in May 2015 with two years to be prepared for this. So most organizations that don't have the technologies or don't have the processes built already will find it difficult to be prepared within two years. Depends on the size of the organization, depends on, again, how it's been communicated and how, again, in some cases, the accountability has been shared. But in most cases, even the ICO, um, are saying be prepared now. This is, a, this is a great point, at least be prepared, start talking with your data protection officers, start building that type of coalition, set the urgency today. The coalition again is a great thing to do, start looking and um, speaking with your internal audit, internal audit teams, looking at again how, the, how ways that they're actually looking to address this new legislation. Definitely speak with your data protection officer, help divine a vision for how the new proposal will affect your role responsibility and also relationship going forward as well. Because again, if this if this legislation comes in, it's going to be here to stay, um, and it's going to it's going to be it's going really going to change the way that data security is handled in most organisations. So it's always great to have others in your group, your peers, again, your shared responsibility across this. It, it shouldn't be the, the sole responsibility of information security to focus on this. Definitely identify your, your business processes that already exist relating to PII and use that protective technology as well. has to be um, the ability to identify broken business processes, um, something that, again, we do, um, and obviously Bytes as well, if you're interested, you can get in contact with Bytes, is we can actually start looking at this for you. We can help with um, some of the technologies, even as a case of a proof of concept, to see if you do already have existing broken business processes, we can definitely help there and help you justify why you need to bring in other technologies. In most organizations we go into, we identify broken business processes that justifies some investment in, in types of DLP that can help them with PII, in some cases even with uh, PCI as well. Definitely communicate and share quick wins. Um, this is, a, again, the movement to a that risk-based data-centric approach and why this is really important to do that. Uh, Risk-based data-centric, as many people will say, is the kind of the, uh, the, the journey's end for most security strategies. And to, to be able to get to that point, you have to communicate and you have to share those quick wins. You have to identify incidents. You have to identify processes. You have to identify um, gaps in your, in your networks, etc. But it has to be risk-based. 
And then finally, um, once you have those processes in place, you have made uh, an investment in technology to be, be specific around data security, then ensure the absorption into the corporate strategy because a security strategy should be aligned with a corporate strategy. And as I said before, the, the, the value of data, especially EU citizen data, is only going, going to grow. So that will form part of a corporate strategy. But it's around the data handling and again, how you protect and in, include, again, some elements of, of trust, how EU citizens can trust your company to again look after their look after your their their data and also your data as well, because um, again this is something really important to uh, to take away as well. It's not just when I say EU citizen data, it's also my data, it's also your data um, that these companies actually need to protect as well. And we want to ensure, ensure, of course, that they handle that appropriately, especially if they if they're valuing that data. We need to ensure that they're actually spending and taking this seriously as well. So um, that's it. I know we've got a few minutes, I think, hopefully for, for questions at the end. I'll just bring up my um, control panel. That's all right. I, I can handle those if you, if, um, so we don't get double um, control okay. panels on the screen, um, Neil. So we have a, a, a myriad of questions to answer so, you know, from a very participative audience. I'm just going to work through these now. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of pose you the question so you can sort of focus on, on what, what your answers are for those, Neil. Um, okay. okay, so the, the first question I have um, is uh, regarding small to medium-sized businesses. Is mm -hmm. there any expectation on small to medium-sized businesses that um, process highly sensitive PII to formally appoint a DPO? So, again, if you process more than 5,000 um, 5, EU citizen data subjects, in a year, then you will need to appoint a data protection officer. Now, most organizations, so from an SMB space, they will typically go to somebody in their legal team and the role would be assigned to them. That's what I'm seeing in most organizations today. They will have that. But again, it doesn't really matter the size of your organization. If you are processing 5,000 data subjects, um, then you will be required to, uh, to have that data protection officer. It's not okay. normally a full-time role. It's definitely a, it's a role that is assigned to somebody that already exists in your organisation. Okay, thank you very much for that, Neil. Um, second question regarding um, local authorities. Um, so uh, local authorities have just complied with PSN security in order to connect to the central government extranet. Are there any additional security that LAs need to consider specifically in regards to this regulation? So it is, uh, I mean, data security. So again, if you are handling, it depends how you're handling and processing any of that data and where it's being stored. Now, from the uh, the technology perspective, again, there isn't there is no specific technology requirements that are made as part of this. But for me, for, for most in most organisations, it's really difficult to actually apply data security without having a specific data security technology. So again, there is, there is no specifics to mention. If you are already, again, already joined with the, uh, the PSN, um, the idea really is, again, even in some cases, looking at how they're looking at uh, data security also. And is there, again, any additions that you can actually bring in to focus on that data security? OK, I have a question regarding cloud. Um, I think it's come up a couple of times, actually. How does the, the legislation relate to cloud vendors and ISPs and our relationships with them? So there's already existing legislation uh, that is put in place for ISPs and cloud providers. So that's already that's already um, gone live. That's already in place. That's already a legislation, a EU legislation. So that is already applicable to to ISPs and, and, and cloud service providers. So that's something they need to comply with today. And this is why we're actually seeing um, so some that may doubt this legislation is is going to come in that will affect all organisations across the EU. It's something to bear in mind that again. ISPs and cloud service providers already have to comply with these standards. Already, um, they have to they have to get um, they have to comply with data breach notification. They have to comply with again looking to uh, the right to be erased. All these kind of things they have to do that already. Um, the majority of uh, again ISPs and cloud service providers there hasn't been a there hasn't been a fine. I think the majority of it will be th this will be a further backing of that legislation once it comes in because again. The, the controllers and the processors of the data will also then be accountable also. But as I said, it's currently, there's legislation in place currently that's been, it's, the reform went through um, last year around this. So those, those, those organizations will already be, um, uh, this legislation is already applicable to them. 
Okay, thank you, Neil. Um, another question regarding third parties. If um, your organisation shares PII with a third party, for example, an occupational health company, who is responsible if a breach occurs, the third party or your company because due diligence wasn't followed in advance? Is there any advice on that? Yeah, so if you're, if you're processing that data as a data processor, and typically it's, so the current legislation is the accountability is all on the data controller. So it's down to the data controller to look at due diligence and to ensure that the, the, the processor is handling that data appropriately. Now with the new legislation, it actually sets the data processor as also being accountable. So again, if you sit within the limit of, of this being relevant to your organization, um, then the data processor can also be fined um, as part of this process. The data controller could also be fined as well if they're, not hand, if, they're, if they're not performing their due diligence. So actually, again, the accountability is now shared rather than solely owned by the, um, the data controller. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding um, one of the, the, the claims made in, in the presentation from, from one of our delegates. Um, he just was asking you to confirm, um, he understood um, that you claimed that, that name and address and date of birth data is worth more to the criminal underworld than card data. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If that's the case, c could you give the source of that fact and what, was that, what, what that's based on? Yes, yeah, so uh, there, there was some research, I believe it was uh, last year, um, so we also do our own research at WebSense, but we didn't publish this. This I think, I believe this was from Dell SecureWorks um, that talked about the, the the value of that PII being more valuable than than a piece of credit card information. So this was something that was um, discussed, and again, this was look, just looking at the underground forums where you see a, a shopping list of of data. If you have access to those, again, I, I recommend um, looking at looking at those areas. But definitely PII name, address, and date of birth. Um, based on that research, uh, was more valuable than that card information. Okay. Um, I can, um, I, if, if you have the details, I can, I can, se I can send you the, uh, the link uh, to that research that those guys did. Great. Um, a question that's come in from, from a fair few amongst the audience um, is regarding um, small to medium-sized businesses. Are there different data protection approaches or requirements for SME versus large business, or is this a one-size-fits-all regulation? So the idea, in the current proposal, it's a it's a one-stop shop. The idea really is it's meant to be applied to all. Now, again, I'm not a <laughs> I can't predict how this legislation will change. I know there has been discussions about changing it again and looking at SMB slightly differently. Um, I would definitely look at the, the current proposal and, uh, and look to, again, identify if there's any exceptions to that. Um, definitely start speaking to your data protection officer if you have one already um, and start looking at typically the impact. As I mentioned before, that, that would be great if you can do that as soon as possible. I would recommend that. But again, I can't, because of my position and uh, the fact that I'm not a lawyer, I can't, can't offer specific advice based on the size of your organization and the type of organization that you are. But I would definitely recommend looking at the uh, looking at the legislation now, if uh, if not already, and speaking to people in your legal team, your data protection officer, etc. For okay. me, it's definitely looking at how ways that you can apply, or even look at your existing technologies that can help you with that as well. So even if you are an SMB and you process PII, looking at the technologies that you have in place that can help you with the notifications, even if it's again, even if it does change specifically for SMBs, how are you actually monitoring? Uh, that, that data, that's, that's something I think, um, again, all SMBs, if I have the opportunity to do that, uh, I think that, that, that would be a great quick win. Thanks, Neil. Uh, so I have a question regarding individuals um, mm -hmm. within organizations. Um, one of our, uh, the delegates has asked, is there any movement towards holding individuals within organizations responsible, as, for example, with HIPAA fines applied to board members? or will fines only be against the organization? So as far as I'm aware, it will be against the organization. It won't be on individuals. Um, and with the current UK Data Protection Act, there obviously was a, there was somebody, in some cases, accountable. And there was obviously talks of, um, again, not just the fines, but a prison term, because you are literally breaking the law. And again, obviously, this, this will be applied for EU, the EU legislation as well. You are literally breaking the law. Um, by not protecting data if you're shown to be negligent or showing gross negligence. As far as I'm aware, 
again, the discussions will be based on the, the company fine, will be based obviously on the company. There may be further action taken against individuals, um, but it isn't isn't really clear. And you know what? There hasn't been really any any even with the current UK Data Protection Act, there hasn't been any examples of that that have happened on a on a on a regular basis that have that have that have bubbled up and have made news. So it's primarily if you're thinking about the of approaching the board and pointing fingers and saying you'll you'll go to jail if, if this doesn't happen, it's definitely unlikely. The impact is typically the uh, the fine, the impact to the business um, as part of this. Um, I don't recommend you you tell your CEO uh, that they are responsible, or your or your DPO, or or whoever in your C-suite that they are responsible, and they will go to jail if they're if they're shown to be ne uh, negligent. Thank you. Um, quick question on public sector bodies: um, What about fines on public sector bodies? Is that the same as private sector? Or how does that work? So again, this is yeah. So again, it will be a it will be applied to all um, all organisations. So if again, if you're in the public sector and you're processing that data, uh, then this will be applied to you. So currently, again, even if you look at the last series of fines over the last few years from the ICO, it has been focused more on public sector. Um, again, this is really this is a really interesting point because I see. There may be there may be some some discussions because it could be the fact that you know from a public sector perspective um, they can't bring in um, certain types of countermeasures uh, because of this because of other budget constraints or other issues but it could be that they're more process uh, driven um, some cases it pro more process driven will require more resource um, so yeah it's kind of a catch twenty two but from the legislation it will be applied to all public and private sector organisations. Okay, thanks, Neil. Um, so, a um, couple of questions on right to be erased. Um, firstly, um, does right to be erased include deleting from old backup tapes? Okay, <laughs> brilliant question. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant question. Um, again, as far as I'm aware, um, the, the right to be erased is erased from all systems, including backups. Now. This is something again. I, I think from a from the challenge perspective, this will be pretty difficult to do. Um, and the idea really is you can have. There's always going to be compensated controls as part of this. So um, this is this is a again. This is this is important. Obviously, data. I mean, a name and address and date of birth. Uh, well, a name and a date of birth doesn't really change. So again, if somebody has that data, and it's archived, and it will be it's it's going to be valid. For long, the, the, the life cycle, of that, the lifetime of that, of that data is kind of critical. So, as far as I'm aware, it needs to be removed from all systems, including backups. So, you need to have some visibility into that. Now, again, that there could be exceptions to that. There's always things. The legislation is obviously very clear on some of the top five statements, as I said, I've made today. Um, it's then going through and looking at some of the guidance and some of the guidelines in specific detail and how they affect you. I think in some, the best best way to summarise there's no there's no this legislation will be a, it will be it will be targeting to ensure that there's things like no gross negligence. So if you, if you do have a full server that's full of PII data, and you allow people to access that, and you don't monitor it, and uh, again you, 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 you there's data being leaked because of broken business processes, then again you're going to be shown to be negligent. If you have data on a backup tape uh, that's one been encrypted, that's one been stored off site. Um, then again, it's unlikely that they will uh, that they will target you. And again, I would definitely speak then to your legal team, again to uh, put that disclaimer in place, um, what that typically means and what the impact your organisation means if you do you have that data that exists already. Okay, just going back to the question on public sector, um, the, the the questioner actually meant how does five percent of worldwide revenue apply to a public sector body? So, yes, this is a uh, cause. Obviously, yeah, I mean, in most cases, there is no revenue as such. Um, so again, it's, uh, it's it's something that has still about it's been outstanding how this actually affects public sector um, and what the impact is going to be. In some cases, it could be a fine that's taken based on um, based on negligence, based on up to a certain amount. So it's either five percent or one hundred million, whichever is the greater. Um, so in some cases, it could be a um, a direct fine again. Um, in that case, again, looking at the technology in a public sector, can you justify or uh, look at a return on investment based on the impact, based on fines? That's something that you need to really start discussing on what it will mean actually to, to you as that organization. Um, 
again, it's it's going to be it's going to be once it's once the proposal comes in, um, you have two years to prepare. Um, so those are the questions potentially you may be asking, uh, obviously sooner rather than later, as part of that process of that of that uh, that time to be prepared. I would still say the first thing to sort of start looking at is again, is it applicable to you? Uh, what is the impact your to your organisation if you're private or public sector, and go through some of the terms and conditions. It's 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 uh, it's a huge it's a huge change, and it, and it, again some of the fundamentals still remain the same, which is why I wanted to cover that today, around the protecting of that data and having purpose and etc. All, all those kind of things, but it's important to understand that um, from the from the again from the EU Parliament who have already approved. The, the, the proposed legislation the EU Parliament have approved, the EU Council are due to approve. Those are the questions that they, they're going to be summarising as part of that to ensure that they are, that are covered as well. So this is what we're waiting for at the moment, the EU Council to approve. And from as part of that, it's looking at the current proposal and what it actually means to you. So there will, there will be changes, there will be potential changes coming in. But the top five item, the top five items I've highlighted today, are something to be aware of today. But again, I can't cover how it affects public and private sectors specifically. Okay, thanks. I'm just going to take two more questions, and anyone who's okay. asked a question that hasn't been answered, I'll make sure that they are contacted post the webinar to have their individual questions asked. Um, but really interesting question. Um, the first question that came in today, actually, I've worked them in reverse order, um, <laughs> is about the USC and Canada. So are the USA and Canada considered to have an adequate level of protection with regard to the international transfer of data? So this is, and again, there's, there's a, looking at the uh, some of the working group 29 and what they're doing around safe harbour and what that means as well. This is, I mean, I would recommend reading, there's a recent paper put out this week that talks about what the impact is going to be on, on this and also how it, how it affects safe harbour. And again, <laughs> It's something that again is I can't uh, I can't offer advice if, if it's if it's permitted or not. Um, definitely a question for your your legal team, but definitely look at the the current working papers again. If you do the hashtag EU Data P in Twitter, you'll find the the recent the recent uh, working group paper that talks about safe harbour, talks about international transfer of data, and how the new legislation will um, will typically impact that as well. It's a good it's a good source of information to have. I'm more than happy to send that link to, to the person who asked that question. So um, okay. if you can send me that, Neil, then I'll make yep. sure that that arrives in your inbox um, so that you can you can do your further research on that specific question. So lastly, um, we have from the audience, I'm just going to pick one. Um, here we go, it's around cloud again. Um, would a cloud database provider acting as a data processor be obliged to delete data in the event of an erasure request, even if the data con controller objects? So, if there's a request, uh, then then yeah, they would need to, based on the based on the current proposal, they would need to um, erase that data. If it belongs to that EU citizen, they would need to erase it. Now, of course, I mean. The right to erasure is something that's been also discussed as well, because in some cases you may need some type of uh, like a, a data, some type of data forensics, because you may need to look at incidents that have occurred as part of that. So if you're using a, a cloud service provider to do that, the idea really is to remove that EU citizen data, and you may have markers in place that will relate back to a, a specific request as part of that, and where it, so so these things need to be definitely managed. Um, and again, if you are a provider of of these services, you and you are the processor by the, by the legal term, you are processing that data. Um, then again, yeah, you would need to comply with the legislation. But it's it's something that again is typically going to be um, it's something you would need to manage because again, sometimes just deleting that data, erasing that data, even though you protect the EU citizen. You may also need to protect your organisation from any type of follow-up, type forensic type work. But again, there there will, there will be guidance around that as well. Um, I, I, I assume it's it's going to be a very common question on on how we actually do that and how we uh, adhere to that. So again, some of it is summarised in the legislation. Uh, I think there will be lots of guidance documents covering that as well. 
The problem is the legislation <laughs> keeps changing some somewhat. There are some changes, so the guidance documents will obviously come after the policy. It's basic information security. You have a policy, you then build some guidelines, and you look at your exceptions. That's typically how I see the legislation coming in. There's still some minor changes, I think, will happen to the legislation as part of the last round of approval. Um, but I do know, again, again uh, looking at... Um, uh, the EU Justice Commissioner. Um, it's going to be. It's going to happen. They say it has to happen within the next six months. I think it's going to be again 2015 at some point um, that it finally gets approved, and then the small uh, kind of items will be uh, kind of in some cases verified, validated. There'll be guidance documents. There will be things coming soon. So, uh, and again, I would I would recommend if there's any questions, specific questions like this, that we uh, um, that we, that we 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 definitely start sharing. Uh, with with our again, if we have works councils, if we have um, again our data protection officers, that we also ask them on a on a regular basis uh, because they're also going to be involved as part of this process. Yeah, that that's great. Um, just to to clarify, someone's asked them regarding the webinar recording, um, that will be available within twenty four hours and. Do feel free to share that with your legal teams and um, with anyone within your organisation that, that will be affected by these um, to obviously start and kick off the planning process. Yeah, sure. I mean, for me, it's, it's definitely advice. There's some recommendations in there around technology. Um, there's definitely, again, this is the potential impact to the business. Um, but by all means, yeah, your legal team, um, your, your data protection officer, your internal audit teams, they should all be aware of this already. If not, this is a great place to start. Um, setting some urgency around what this is going to mean to your organization. It's a, it's a key theme when I go to conferences, security conferences now, when I speak, it's a key theme, there's lots of questions around this and what it's going to mean, so it's the time really to act is now. Um, but as I said, this recording, the webinar is focused on what it's going to mean to your business, how you can start getting prepared, and how you can use technology for that as well. Um, again, the disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, so I would definitely be speaking to your, your, your legal team. As, as soon as possible. Well, thank you very much, Neil. Um, I think we'll wrap it up now as questions are sort of tailing off. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for attending. Thank you with, for your patience with a couple of the technical glitches uh, along the way today. I hope you found it useful and informative. And all that remains for me to do is to thank Neil for, for your time and thank you for, for your input today um, and all the questions. Um, thanks very much, everyone, and good afternoon. Yeah, good morning still. <laughs> thanks. Bye now. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks.